more lately I've been, I have been doing some organizational design work. Um, I've done this through a consultancy called SY Partners that really focuses on um, mission, vision, and purpose, but for like Fortune 50 companies. So I've done this for Pfizer, for NBC Universal, um, Microsoft, um, big traditional companies. And more recently, I've been focusing on ways of working and helping traditional organizations be more agile um, and cross-functional. Um, I'm doing that through the consultancy called Nobel. So today, um, I'm going to offer you a framework for experience design that I developed that looked at real world experiences. Um, and what this is going to offer you, I know some folks are talking about kind of governance and governance structures and org design. What this session is going to focus on is really like those inflection moments um, and what the, the experience is of the people in the group and how to kind of design and toy with those moments um, from a very experiential angle. Um, we'll have some reflection questions um, for welcoming people to participate into something new that is based on this framework. Uh, yeah, um, I see Aaron's done um, a lot of time with workshop design. So some of this might seem familiar to you. Um, thanks everybody for chiming in in the chat. Keep, keep that going. Um, also, I welcome people to um, turn on their mic and, and speak up a little bit during this. So if I present a concept or, or go somewhere that like, needs a bit of clarification, um, definitely pipe up. Or if you have like an anecdote you wanna share, that is welcome too. Any questions before I jump in? Cool, all right, so. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, are you the person who wrote the um, blog post that's like, um, Circle, it talks a lot about thresholds and design of like circle, uh, circles that the, you step it, into. I forget what it's called. Are you, are you thinking of the magic circle as one piece of it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so patterns of transformation. Yes, yes that's patterns of transformation. Oh, yeah, yeah. cool. Great. I love that. I love that stuff. <laughs> nice. We're, we're going to talk through that, I'm, or I'm going to talk through that framework, and then we're going to kind of discuss it as it applies to, to your work. So very cool to hear, Aaron, that you've um, encountered that. So so folks know that um, this is all written up on a website and like um, openly accessible. So I'm going to talk you through the framework, but there's, um, you know, if you're inclined, there's more materials to dive into. But again, I'm here in service of you and the work that you're doing. And so I encourage you to kind of think about how it applies to the communities and the groups that you are in charge of influencing um, and supporting and help me translate what I know into something useful for you. Um, cool. So um, I, um, I did research on transformative social experiences and what I was looking for um, was experiences that involve some element of real risk, be that social, emotional, or physical, um, experiences that involve active participation. So this is not a show. It's not like content that is being delivered. It, is, it only happens because everybody there does something and engages. Um, they're fundamentally social and interpersonal. Um, they have transformative potential. So this means that by going through the experience, you somehow fundamentally shift people's sense of themselves or the world around them. And this can be a very small shift, um, but it has, you know, it's kind of at the root of like how people navigate the world. Um, I see a reference to um, pattern languages down there. And, and yeah, uh, Christopher Alexander's pattern languages was certainly uh, inspiring for some of the stuff I've done. Um, the last quality that I saw in the experiences I was interested in studying is that they're inexhaustible. Um, and what I mean by this term, it's that what any one person or individual goes through as a result of participating in the experience is so vast and varied that the people who are kind of in charge of like facilitating or enabling the experience cannot predict what any one person will experience because it's so personal and relational and situational um, that the, the potential there um, and the variety is quite literally inexhaustible. Um, so what these case studies were, were sex parties, funerals, and wilderness trips. Um, and these are the qualities that I saw them having in common. So um, my goal with looking at these experiences together as all designed experiences um, that when at their best, they support they support human enrichment and human potential. 
Um, my goal in looking at these was to come up with a design framework. So people who are trying to kind of create these moments of like connection and exploration and like experiencing something new or something challenging can do it in a really enriching way. And so the four design components I looked at were the risk, the magic circle, which Aaron has already kind of pointed out, the structure of the experience, and then the nature of the transformation. I suspect in your work, um, the pieces of this that are going to be kind of most relevant for thinking about like what your participants and community go through and like how to create rituals and moments for them that are relevant to like how you want them to be together and what you want them to do is going to be the magic circle and the structure of the experience. I'm going to run through everything though um, and uh, just to kind of give you a complete picture of it and then we'll talk a little bit more about the magic circle and the structure. Just want to pause for a second. Any kind of like thoughts, questions, reflections before I move forward? I'm going to go through each of these categories next. You're welcome to kind of jump into the chat or go ahead and turn your microphone on as well. Okay, seems like folks are ready for the next thing. So. When we look at risk, um, I, I kind of define risk as like any um, threat um, to one's kind of way of being um, or sense of safety. And with the experiences I looked at, I saw the risk as either social, emotional, or physical. Um, and again, we're trying to kind of like get at the like root, most base kind of human experience here. Um, a social risk means that you're risking your connection or relationship to others. Um, sex parties are very much about social risk. Emotional risk means it will kind of like bring up an emotional experience or like feelings or, um, you know, like emotional sensations that are challenging to deal with or you might avoid otherwise. Funerals often uh, involve emotional risk. And then physical risk is any threat to your kind of physical well being. Uh, and wilderness trips fell into this category. When it came to the risk, um, I saw the risk as really important for the transformative potential of the experience. The whole point of these experiences, and again, I'm kind of looking at more extreme experiences than what you all are, are engaging with, but that you need to, like the point of the experience is to let people engage with the risk. And so you have to figure out which of these risks is actually has the most potential um, to offer something like enriching for the people who are engaging with it. And what you need to do is allow them to navigate that risk, but mitigate the fringe risks. Um, and so, you know, if you want people to be able to kind of like grapple with difficult emotions, like how can you make it easier for them to be together and be with each other as they do that? So you're going to mitigate the social risk by allow and allow the emotional risk to kind of stay in place. Um, similarly, if you want people to kind of like test their like physical capabilities and their, their sense of, um, physical well-being and safety, like how can you mitigate and manage the emotional risks? that are connected to that um, so that focusing on the physical risk is possible. Um, then there's the magic circle. And so this is not something I came up with. This is something kind of borrowed from game design. The concept of the magic circle is this idea that experiences, you know, have an invisible perimeter around them that kind of dictates like when you're inside of them, uh, new norms, potentials, behaviors are possible that when you're outside of them are not. A classic example of this will, is like playing a card game with your friends. These like pieces of paper with markings on them that are, you know, valueless and nearly meaningless outside the game. Once you're playing the game, they have a lot of value and consequence and they animate behavior. And that happens because everybody's kind of agreed to what those pieces of paper, those, those you know, card work playing cards mean. The other sign that the magic circle is at play though, is that you're, you, you can usually, <laughs> when you're playing a card game, it's possible to kind of like insult or swear or like, you know, exhibit kind of um, confrontational behavior um, that outside of the card game would be totally unacceptable and like deeply offensive. But while you're playing the game, it actually like enhances the experience of play. That's a sign that a magic circle is at play that like what is valuable, what is condoned, what is possible inside of it is different than your day-to-day -day life. So I looked at like, in, and, and so if you want people to kind of experience something different, engage differently, um, see new possibilities, um, 
figuring out how to cast a magic circle or create a magic circle around an experience is incredibly important. I saw the magic circle in, in the, again, in the experiences I looked at as either conditioned or embraced. Um, this is usually the distinction that people have the hardest time rocking. So like, I'm going to describe this, but if it's fuzzy, we can come back to it. A conditioned magic circle happens simply by conditioning people to behave or expect or engage differently with each other. So a sex party is an example of that. Like it would be a normal party if you didn't already kind of condition people to like be more sexually permissive or sexually open um, at that. There's otherwise kind of no, no risk or no difference. Um, card game would also be an example of like a conditioned magic circle by everybody kind of agreeing to different rules and um, expectations of how they are together, something different is possible. An embraced magic circle involves kind of casting, uh, I, I, you know, I'm using kind of sort of magical language here. Um, like you cast a magic circle around a reality that without some sort of support or experiential structure is like really hard or impossible to like engage with. Um, unless there's some sort of um, support. So in this case, the wilderness, like you can't step into the wilderness with the same kind of like expectations and like posture that you do in your day-to-day -day life because that physical risk and threat will just like completely overwhelm you. So you need to kind of cast a magic circle around the wilderness in order to make it approachable and navigable. Similar thing with a funeral, the reality of a death, a deceased loved one is like, can be so like, overwhelming and upsetting that you need to kind of cast a magic circle ar around it to embrace that reality so that people can approach it. So there, the, the magic circle is either conditioned or embraced or cast. Um, I see somebody recommending temporary autonomous zone for sure. That's like definitely um, a, a work that like focuses a lot on like magic circle and creating new possibilities um, by having other realities together. That's the magic circle. The next thing is the structure. I think the structure is really important. Um, different, again, different than kind of governance structures. What is the experience structure? And this is really like, how, once people are inside of the magic circle, how do they navigate it? How do they navigate the, the space of possibility and engage with what is there? Looking at the most fundamental level, um, I saw the structures of these experiences as either exploratory, progressive, or cyclical. Now, Oftentimes we're, we're used to kind of like organizing time linearly, at least a lot of the experiences that I'm asked to kind of engage with and think about. It's like, what happens first? What happens next? It's like, there's like a show flow or, you know, you're organizing time. That would be this kind of progressive one in the middle. One thing progresses after another. Uh, and so people are kind of like moving through the experience like together in a sequence. A different kind of structure would be an exploratory structure where once you're in the experience, it is up to the, the participants, the guests, users, however you want to call them, to kind of choose how they navigate and where they go. Um, and so they're, they're in, a, in a place of exploration there. And so they need to kind of like have their own agency, their own will, and they have to kind of get something back from the environment to like indicate like, oh, I can pursue my interests here. Um, if I explore like worthwhile things will happen. And the third kind of structure is a cyclical structure whereby like repeating the same things, um, you get acclimated and lulled into a new environment. So to go back to my case study examples, most funerals are progressive in that you follow a sequence of events that involves people kind of getting together, experiencing some sort of program, maybe socializing and then um, putting the body to rest in some format. So that's like very progressive in terms of one after another. Uh, many of the sex parties I looked at were exploratory in that like once you're at the gathering, you can kind of like navigate as you like. You can kind of like chill out at the bar. You can go in the like cool down room or you can kind of engage with people who are doing something a little bit more raucous. So you're kind of exploring and navigating the space. Um, I saw the wilderness trips I looked at more often than not um, ascribed to actually a cyclical structure. And this was a little bit um, elusive because many wilderness trips often involve traveling from one point to another over the course of a few days or many days. But in terms of the structure of the experience itself, it actually was based on the rhythm of the day and how people together structured the rhythm of every day in terms of getting up and like eating, preparing food, breaking down camp, 
traveling, however they're going to travel, setting up camp again, that cyclical structure and managing roles and expectations and tasks. And that that's actually what lulls you into the experience of the wild and like um, interdependence and radical self-reliance. So I encourage you to think about like when with the communities and groups you're working with, how, how do you want them to navigate the space? Um, what can they choose? And what do they follow? Like this program that we're in now is very much a kind of progressive structure of one thing after another. There's a little bit of a cyclical component because what you did yesterday is similar to what you're doing today, but with different content. But overall, it's kind of a progressive structure. So, you know, getting really clear about your structure will make it easier for you to figure out how to support people in navigating um, the space together. And then lastly, there's the nature of the transformation. Um, I saw the transformation is either repetitive and that like by visiting an experience over and over again, it slowly shifts um, your relationship to yourself and the world around you. Um, many of the sex parties I looked at could, could be seen this way and that like by visiting several of them, you renegotiate your own relationship to your sexuality. There's also an acute transformation, usually where something dramatic happens to you. And then the point of the experience is to like, reckon with or negotiate like how your world is different because something has happened. Um, funerals fall into this category where you have this kind of acute change that somebody you are connected with or cared about like was alive and is suddenly dead. And the point of the funeral is to like engage with that reality and negotiate the, the truth of that reality. Um, and then a dramatic transformation happens after like a buildup of an experience and then there's a shift as a result of the buildup. Many of the wilderness trips I looked at function this way where after being in the wild for a period of time, suddenly there's a shift. Suddenly you're kind of more comfortable in the wild than you could ever have remembered being. Um, and that changes your relationship to kind of like civilized, you know, society. So my approach with this framework is to give experience designers, folks who are like looking at social connection um, around kind of new possibilities, challenging possibilities where people's norms don't necessarily apply. Like, how, like what are the big picture decisions you need to make in terms of designing the experience that will help with like all the other decisions going forward? Um, I see a comment from Aaron. Um, FWB Fest had me in a magic circle inside of a magic circle inside of a magic circle. Yeah. And so it's interesting, like, it sounds like that was like a very like transporting experience if there was like many magic circles inside of each other. Um, I often see that like when the magic circle's really strong, it's all that much more important to have a strong structure inside of it because if you're completely transported outside of your reality, and there's not like a structure within the magic circle to support it, you end up like there's a potential to like act and behave in ways that like actually make it hard to kind of go back um, and integrate and reckon with the experience. So the strength of the magic circle needs to match the strength of the structure. If the magic circle is super loose, you can get away with the structure being a bit looser. Um, but a mismatch there is is really challenging. Um, like if you have a really strong structure that's like super different from what people are used to, but you haven't created a magic circle around that structure to help people kind of arrive with the right kind of like expectations, mindsets, um, even having the right people arrive, navigating that structure is going to be like very like repelling and challenging. So that's kind of going into the relationship there a little bit. Um, I'm going to pause there and just like invite folks like if there are kind of any reactions thoughts questions again a lot of this was developed looking at like in-person social experiences but there there are principles to kind of tease out for the decentralized communities that you're dealing with especially as it relates to like time and temporality and connection so there's a lot to a lot to throw at you in 15 or 20 minutes Uh, could you clarify on structure cyclical one more time? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so a, a cyclical experience um, involves a similar set of activities, I'll call them, repeating. Um, and so imagine if this 
convening that we're in now, the governance um, learning convening, um, it was like six or seven days. And every day you did this structure where you had like a kind of lecture content portion and then like a collaborative um, workshop portion in the afternoon. And you kind of went through that every single day. Like by the end of that, you'd be full of new ideas and like new potential and like really have shifted. Now you're already getting there in two days, but like imagine that being stretched out. Um, so that would be a cyclical structure. So it's not like one thing happens after another, but then it repeats. And so similarly with like a wilderness trip, again, it's like the rhythm of like getting up at a certain time, like prepping camp, prepping food, getting ready to go on the trail, like that cyclical nature of like doing the same thing um, acclimates you to like a new reality and a new set of potentials. So Does that so yep. like the format, the format of structure can be cyclical, but the content in that format can be progressive. Yeah. And I would say, yeah. So this, and, and I think you're bringing up an important point that like these structures aren't totally mutually exclusive. Like you can, you'll have parts of them show up. What my advice from a design perspective, if you're designing an experience for participants is like figure out what the core and base structure is. And like on top of that, you can have like, moments of exploration or like moment, right? Like if the base structure is cyclical, like making that really strong and reliable will make it easier to have like little bits of different things on top. Um, but like making a choice of what your structure is, is gonna be really helpful for people like getting the most out of the experience. Um, so that's my kind of general recommendation. So yeah, so like if the structure is primarily cyclical, like. Does, does the content of each of those things that happens in the cycle have to be exactly the same? No, but like there is an overarching pattern there. Whereas like, again, if you kind of imagine this, this gathering where it's like you did, like there was like a bunch of kind of like intro activities um, and like kind of like things that helped everybody get to know each other and get some topics on the table. And then like a, a day of like prioritization and sorting of the topics and then a day of like storytelling and sharing around your experience of those topics. And then like a workshop day around like how you evolve that, that would be more of a progressive structure where you're kind of like really breaking out very different activities that build on one another that kind of results in a shift. Cool. I see some nodding. So it sounds like that's kind of come through. So yeah, so it's a, it's kind of, and similarly with like an exploratory structure, it's like people might choose to kind of, have a cyclical experience within an exploratory structure because they find stuff that they like and they just want to repeat that. That's fine, but that's their choice. Like you might have other people navigating the space very differently. Um, I see a comment here from Aaron. Um, for sure, also the stronger the magic circle, the more important it is um, to very intentionally design the exit ritual and thresholds. Yes, for sure. Um, this is something that um, can sometimes be like overlooked. Like we think like, people think about folks getting into the experience. They might not realize like that they're making a magic circle, but they are, but then like, how do folks exit? Um, what is the off ramp? Um, and yes, the stronger the magic circle, the more you need to kind of think about that transition back out. I would say even if the magic circle is like fairly kind of like loose and porous and like doesn't represent a rad totally radical departure from your day-to-day -day life, um, considering the, the design of the, exit of that experience, the movement out of the magic circle um, is really important for people being able to kind of like understand, contextualize, and again, integrate what they have been to. Uh, yep, for sure. Burning Man is a great example of this. It's definitely something that comes to mind. And so Burning Man, like, let's run this through. Like, you know, I would say Burning Man, like, yes, there's a physical component in terms of being I'm assuming everybody's familiar with Burning Man. If you're not, speak up and we'll give you kind of like a quick rundown. But um, there's a lot of work to kind of mitigate the, the physical risk um, involved in Burning Man so that you can kind of engage in this, I, what I would call a social risk of like, just like being somebody different, engaging with other people on like completely different norms and expectations, radically different than what we do in day-to-day -day life. And so there's like intense work done to mitigate that physical risk around dealing with the elements. But that that pressure of that physical risk um, helps accentuate the benefit of that completely wide open social risk, which is like very much not managed in many ways. Um, 
uh, the magic. So, and, and Burning Man's an interesting example of this, right? Cause there is a wilderness component cause you're kind of out in the desert needing to have radical self-reliance, but um, people are also behaving very differently with each other. And so this is an instance where there's a bit of a combination of like an embraced magic circle. Cause you have to embrace this like wilderness type setting but also conditioning to behave very differently. Uh, so you have kind of both elements going on there. In terms of the structure, the structure is like by default, very much exploratory, right? You have this vast city um, with very different kinds of things happening that you just kind of get to go out and explore. Um, you may be part of a camp that has a bit of a cyclical structure in order to have the camp run to support you and to kind of like manage that physical risk that's going on. But fundamentally, the structure is exploratory. Like what you do from one day to the next varies wildly for most people who go. Again, they might choose to have more of a cyclical experience, um, but that is their choice. If we look at Burning Man as a whole, the design is totally exploratory. And then the nature of the transformation that you go through there um, is very much dramatic in that like over the course of the week, the longer that you're in this alternative space, the more you acclimate to that alternative and, and let go of everything that you kind of brought in. So that's an example of like taking an experience that we've seen that arguably we can say is like quite well designed um, in terms of a transformative experience. And it's like, what, what are the design elements kind of coming through again at the kind of most kind of broad level? Any other thoughts or comments? I have a series of questions that I kind of want to toss at you all that are ho hopefully kind of relevant to some of the work that you're doing and the questions that you're grappling with. That's what's coming next, but any other thoughts or comments? It's making me think that part of what can be so uh, disorienting about digital life is that there, you're constantly moving in and out of these like virtual magic circles, uh, like each discord is is a kind of magic circle with a very, very weak uh, threshold. And and then there's also the kind of uh, the, the lack of, I guess, synchronization between the magic circles you're entering virtually uh, through the screen and then the circles that you're a part of with in, the, in your physical world. So constantly having to like move between them, exit and enter these thresholds is mm -hmm. part of what kind of disorienting. Yeah, I think that's really well said, Aaron. And I saw a lot of people um, thumbs upping and plussing that. Um, and so I think that that's a, a really interesting design challenge to think about is like, how do you, given the disorientation that that creates, and I, I, I suspect sometimes disorientation is great and other times it actually mitigates people's ability to like participate and engage. I imagine that the porousness of those magic circles can make it like overwhelming and confusing to figure out how to participate and engage. And so what are you doing um, as folks who have kind of like influence or investment in those communities? Like how, how do you kind of design the magic circle in a way that um, actually, let's just go ahead to the, um, right? So like clear boundaries versus fuzzy, fuzzy boundaries, like who is welcome, how do they know? Um, what does it look like to be in that magic circle? Um, so like how much presence and engagement um, does it take to really be like in the experience of that particular discord? Um, and then what it, like what is the friction to entry? You're identifying that the friction to entry is extremely low. And so like the sense making and the wayfinding that has to happen once you're in there is like, I would imagine is like super high. Um, and so like, what does it take to do that work? Especially because, you know, and I'd be curious to hear from you all, like, like do those experiences have a clear structure? Is it a matter of kind of showing up and exploring? Is it an exploratory structure without like a clear magic circle, like perimeter that puts a lot of onus on the individual to like understand like what space have I entered? What is possible to navigate here? Like what is like condoned and supported? Um, what might be um, challenging or disruptive um, can be like a lot of work to sort that out. That's like, you know, what, what I'm guessing based on what I know, you all know this very better. And then also like, how do, how do people leave and like, how do they come back? And again, like the, the, the friction to entry on these um, digital distributed communities is super low. And so 
in some ways being able to kind of like actually leave and let go and like fully come back might be enriching for an individual's experience because they when they come back they come back a little bit different a little bit refreshed um when is that possible and valuable and like when do they feel like they need to have like persistent engagement to like be invested um or be contributing or be current on what is going on and that 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 is a high expectation to have on folks in terms of energy attention that kind of thing yeah um, so I think that that's a great thing that you point out, Aaron. And, and, and so, yeah, what I'm, any other comments? I, I could, I could keep riffing, but I'm curious to hear from you all if you have kind of thoughts on, on this. It's, it sounds like the, the magic circles are like very intense in terms of like the kind of alternative realities that they can create, but like the, the boundaries are fuzzy. And so what can, what, what can be changed or shifted or added that, um, allows for the entry and the exit into the experience to actually support engagement and participation in, in a richer way. That's kind of what I wonder. Um, I'm seeing a, some comments here on the chat. Um, there's too much optionality in digital spaces for sure. So you need ways to constrain that, um, making something synchronous, right? Increasing barriers for people to join. Yeah. And um, I say increasing barriers and friction to join um, you can think about it as like, how do you, again, how do you condition people, right? This conditioned magic circle, how do you condition people to like be in the right place and the right mindset and know, know certain expectations so that their participation is actually like more on point, more valued. Um, and so creating some barriers to entry is not necessarily about keeping people out, but making sure that when people are in, they're like fully in. Um, and that, that notion of optionality is, is a sign that like this open exploratory space is almost like too open. And so like, and this is not necessarily about like constraining behavior once you're there, but like, can you give people starting points where it's like, try this, try this, try this, like as ways to start to, so that they can kind of like understand and acclimate to the space, but are still like in that exploratory mindset. I see Amy's commenting here um, on avoiding um, frictionless everything, intentional, right, yes, exactly. Intentional friction can be good if it's like, again, looking at like what what is valuable about this experience or what, um, where is the potential like, and how can you like support people in arriving for and enabling that potential? And that's the purpose of the friction, exactly. Other Other comments or thoughts? It's interesting how uh, legal legal incorporation functions as a kind of default magic circle boundary, which makes it easier to know when you fully entered inside. So the extra legal nature of crypto makes the you know organizational membranes way more porous, in part because of the kind of existing in the legal gray zone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which which is, you know, part of its value, right? Like, I would imagine that that's certainly not something to change, but it is something to kind of design for um, so that, yeah, that, that experience of, like, accessibility and um, democratic participation, like, amounts to something in a way. No. Yeah, so the next thing, you know, and we've kind of touched on this a little bit in terms of structures is like loose structures versus well-bound pathways. And, um, you know, there was a, a comment already, um, Shreyas, hopefully I'm saying your name right, in terms of like too much absentality, like too, like when the structure is like too loose, you don't have like clear pathways. Um, what are the, like, where are you creating excess challenge uh, for potential um, participants that, that, it's, it's not the right kind of friction, right? Like that friction doesn't like actually support participation and engagement fully. So like, how do people know what, how do people know what to do? Um, how do people know what the potential and the options are? And I think this is a question that is worth really like asking of the communities that you're looking at and participating in. Like, how do people figure it out? Um, is it from watching how other people behave? Is it from doing things and seeing what happens as a result of it? Is it something else? Is it a matter of like consuming documentation or a matter of like, you know, who invites them in and like a knowledge sharing kind of mentorship 
model that happens like you know there's there's people have to figure out how to you know know what to do and so what are what are they doing in the absence of anything that's deliberately designed around that and then you can design based on that you can amplify the behavior that is like working um, it's not necessarily about designing something from scratch what is rewarded and how um, especially in like these highly social um, emergent structures like people people develop ways to kind of like condone or um, reprimand certain kinds of behavior um, overtly or covertly or, you know, subtly or literally. Um, and so keying into that, like, you know, has a big influence on like what kinds of behaviors are condoned. Again, if you don't have these well-defined pathways already in place. And then how do people manage their energy, attention and, and will? Um, what about the group supports people's ability to manage their energy, attention, and will? And what about the group might create kind of um, friction there, or confusion uh, that means that people are, are doing that in, in radically different ways that mean that they're um, not as connected to each other as perhaps they could be. So any, any thoughts or questions on this? Well, yeah, it kind of, kind of comes down to space, time, and connection. Um, so, yeah. And I know Aaron's been speaking up a, a fair bit and offering really great commentary. Other folks are certainly welcome to come off microphone too and, and comment. I will say that, unfortunately, I cannot be with you in the afternoon. Um, so if there's anything that you want kind of clarification on now or to kind of tease out a little bit, um, now's the time to do it. I haven't been looking at the Figma, so I'm not quite sure if folks have been taking notes in there. Hopefully you have, um, but yeah. I can share the slides. Um, the website that has like a fuller write-up of this, I just put into the, uh, into the chat there. Um, this is not yet well formed as a question, um, but just in your uh, sort of the experience and the, the observations that you met, uh, what you made, um, ha do you have any examples of maybe you had the intention or you've designed it in a certain manner um, or a certain like space and that has shifted um, in maybe like just unintentionally as a designer, like the designer doing that. Um, and if, and how, like, if you have any observations to share about um, those types of moments. So when you say that the, are you saying that, that the conditions have shifted? Is that it? Like, um, so if like an example, maybe like risk is not such a uh, easy one, but like, maybe you want it to be progressive and then things kind of uh, like mm -hmm. people actually want to be exploratory. And then, so you have to sort of shift midway through the, the experience in itself, Yeah. Um, how that's been navigated or whether that is like a successful or is it, let's restart mm. let's step back and like, you know, next time we try again. Got it. Yeah. Well, so um, hearing that example where it's like people kind of like show up and like they kind of break the structure right like the 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 group like has a will and an interest that is like different than what was designed and they kind of override the structure that is there in that case i would say that there what i would mess with is not necessarily like yes like as a good kind of like community engager facilitator like you should look at what the group is trying to do why um, and like pivot with them. That pivot might involve trying to like bring them back into the structure that you already designed um, or like allowing it to be exploratory. That can be very challenging though, for sure. Cause it's like, what potential you, are you serving, right? Like what, what do you want the ultimate outcome to be? And like, how can you convey that intention in a way that like might help the, the folks there collaborate more with you on like restructuring it in the moment? 
Um, that's like a, a tact that I would take. So not necessarily exerting control, but just be like, hey, like, here's the intention with this space. Here's why we have you here. Like, how can we do this together? And like, rely on your responsibility to the group to like be able to kind of make some decisions about like possibilities that get put up, but demonstrate that willingness to collaborate um, and that willingness to pivot can generate a lot of um, goodwill uh, in the people who are kind of otherwise like shifting and changing things that are different than what you designed. I would say if you have people kind of like departing from the structure dramatically over the course of the experience, I would look at like, it, was your magic circle well designed? Because the magic circle should get people into like the right conditions so that they're showing up to participate in the way that is like um, most desirable for the kind of like experience or connection or possibility that you're creating. So, so from a design perspective, I would say that's a magic circle problem. If people are not like able to engage in the structure, um, then th you don't necessarily change the structure, you change the magic circle around the structure. There's also a possibility that like whatever is inside your magic circle, the potential that is there like needs a different kind of engagement. Um, and so, yeah, what's so what's what's going on there? Like, what is that potential that people are responding to that like you as the designer, the convener, community manager, like uh, sized up differently? And so like, what's the what's the disconnect there? Does that answer your question, Amy? I realize you said your question was like not fully formed, but I I like where you're going. We're like you know. Part of part of the magic of these experiences, which is what is kind of challenging and overwhelming for them is, you know, when you're coming to them, having created them or having some sort of responsibility towards them is like, you cannot control what people are going to do. And like, that's actually why the experience is valuable and has potential. And so it's this like interplay. And that's like, uh, there's like deeper stuff in the research I did where it's like, how can we approach design that is not about control? Um, um, and that's that kind of inexhaustible piece. Um, and that also like in these experiences, like, yes, I was looking at risk, but like, I think you all, you all are probably looking at something slightly different in terms of, um, I don't know, radical potential or like, I, I don't know how I would explain it, but controlling what people do or controlling the outcome is like exactly counterintuitive to the whole reason. Um, and so the point of having these structures, having the magic circle is in order to kind of like channel like emergent behavior in a way. Um, and so reminding yourself that like you're in service of that. And so like, I often say like, if the only thing happens in your community or in your experience is what you've anticipated, then you've done something wrong. There, there, there should be new potential and new possibilities that you could not envision um, because you have supported people well, because you have like identified something worthwhile um, and created a container around it that makes it possible for people to engage and like do stuff that like would not be possible otherwise. And like you um, as the convener, as the designer are like humble to do that. And so Amy, I love your question because it, it points to the need to be able to kind of like pivot um, in real time because of that emergence. Um, yeah, so I'd be looking at like, yeah, what, like, why are people behaving differently than what I expected? Like, are they still like fundamentally in service of the potential? Like, are we in agreement about what the potential is? Or are they seeing something that I'm not? Like, how, how can you kind of engage in a bit of a collaborative moment around that? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if anyone else in this group, like also thinks about sort of like the role. So some background is that I was in this, um, community like head of community role where we're managing this big transition and one of the things is that um when you have a community that's so large which is like all of all these like crypto communities essentially there's sort of like i can imagine like maker at like one protocol as one magic circle but maybe it's the split there's like mu multiple magical circles happening inside this like organization so there's so many people with different ideas and how things should be and how they are able to like um, move about something that I see that just like the role of a head of community is really finding like shared missions and visions and ideas and then being able to like group these people to then maybe like people who might be down for a similar magic circles to kind of like help collect them together and then and then that's like maybe one like one working group or something and then there's sort of these different um 
group. So, so that's how I think about like how this is nestled in one larger org, because ideally if you were in like a startup with like 10 people, it's, it's easier to get that input of like, Hey, everyone, we're going to try this magic circle. But then I think when you have so many layers of like a foundation, uh, this community, you've got contributors, you've got like core developers, it's, it's much more complex. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I, I, I can empathize with like this feeling of kind of like overwhelm and confusion as you're like trying to navigate that and trying to support that when there's so many different um, activities and so many different like kinds of people um, and, and people with like, you know, different availabilities, different interests, different skills, like showing up, um, like how do you channel that? Um, and so figuring out how to group people loosely um, so that like their engagement becomes like harmonious and sustaining in a way instead of too chaotic um, sounds like the right questions to ask. Has anybody else like had experience with that or like good traction around that? Well, you'll have time this afternoon to kind of keep digging into it for sure. And so I, I wonder in that circumstance, like you're talking about magic circles within magic circles, like can you can you create very small experiences within that that give people an opportunity to kind of like test an idea or like get to know each other differently um, that can just kind of like help pivot the kind of like overall group. Um, and so the, the ask is not necessarily super big um, in terms of like, time or investment, but like it just creates a little bit of a pivot. And so I'm just riffing here, right? Like I'm, I don't work in the context you work in, so I'm not sure if this is helpful, but I wonder if you think about like, is there a cyclicality that you as the um, community manager can offer in terms of like little um, touch bases or like moments of connection or like experiments um, in ways to collaborate? that can evolve over time, but that the community kind of gets used to like jumping into these things, trying a thing and then jumping back out. And that over time you end up kind of discovering what works and also conditioning the community to kind of relate to each other in a particular way, just kind of riffing there. And then it's like a lighter weight experiment for you um, to figure out what would work. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? I mean, it's interesting like to be in a space where there's like so much like enthusiasm and energy and like people showing up and like really contributing. It's like how like how do you channel that momentum? How do you um, yeah create possibilities there? Yeah, we're near to time. Thanks for thanks for sharing that, Caden. It's been a pleasure to share with you all. Um, you're doing exciting work. Um, I have a lot of work for what you're what you're up to. So perhaps there's a, a little check out in the chat. Um, I don't know if we're gonna get launched out of here, but just one one idea or concept that was useful to you or like a, an idea that you had or a thought that you had that's like sticking with you from this. If you can just kind of toss that into the chat as our, our closing thing. I'd love to hear from folks. Designing more intentional exit experiences, rituals. Yeah, thanks. Figuring out the best base structure first. Mm -hmm. You can do all sorts of things on top of that, but like you create a lot of like trust um, from people if they can rely on a base structure. Exit liquidity, yeah, but make it a vibe. <laughs>
something I'll do, let's see. I'm gonna stop sharing screen here. I'm gonna share the link to the slides um, just so you have that also. Amy valued all the discussion around designing magic circles. Cool. Awesome. Well, uh, I just want to thank you, Ida, for uh, uh, sharing with us today. Um, I enjoyed this even more the second time around. But uh, um, let's see. So uh, we have the schedule has a break for lunch now for about an hour. Uh, and we'll meet back in OYA uh, to uh, do a workshop and, and work together on the Fig Jam. So we'll see you all then. Thanks, Ida. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have fun this afternoon. Thank you.